Um, glad to have a good turnout tonight, despite a possible tropical depression passing uh, near us. So I appreciate you, uh, you coming out. I want to recognize just a couple folks who've um, helped a lot in this. Um, members of the ABC uh, Board of Directors, um, which includes, I don't actually know where they're all sitting, uh, Bill McAvinney, um, who's around somewhere, probably in the hall actually collecting signatures for the minimum wage increase. Um, we have Sam Seidel, who is standing in the back there, former city councilor, member of ABC Board. Um, Alec Papazian, um, who is just, just walking in, our other board member, and this is Bill. And then Pamela Philo, um, talking over in the corner there. So I just want to thank the board members um, and all the members of ABC, uh, including our Policy and Elections Committee, who've put a lot of work in to get this going, as well as other elections-related work. I don't want to take any more time. I just want to say thank you for coming. I'm going to pass it on uh, to our moderator, who we're uh, very fortunate to have, uh, former city councilor uh, David Sullivan. Thanks, Jesse. Hi, everybody. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to start by thanking Jesse and all the great people from ABC for putting this together. Um, they've done an amazing job in a short amount of time, and it's really impressive to watch. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for being here. And especially, I'd like to thank the candidates. Um, having been one myself once upon a time, I know how hard this is, and I know Nobody wants to take time away from door knocking to come to a candidate's night, but here they all are. And so let's give them all a round of applause. Um, so as you can see, we have a challenge tonight, which is that we have a lot of candidates. Uh, here's a fun fact. Um, the last time there were three vacancies, meaning three people not running for re-election on the city council was 1989. And I know that because I was one of those three people not running for re-election that year. And uh, the other two were Sondra Graham and Elva Lucci, for those of you who are paying attention to this thing. It was a long time ago, but there we are. Um, so that year, by the way, there were 28 candidates running, so that might tell you something. Um, so because of the, so let me say a little bit about the format. I don't want to take too long here. Um, the goal here is to be out of here by 8.30. You'll be glad to know. And we're basically going to do a first round, which will give everybody two minutes to answer a question that I will ask them. Um, I'm going to ask them to um, be as respectful as they possibly can be of the time. And I'd like to thank our timekeeper for showing everyone a sign that's going to tell them how much time they have left. Um, I'd like you all to please hold your applause till the end so that we don't take up any more of our precious time. Uh, after the first round, and we're going to sort of ask people in random order, as you'll see, um, we're going to have a, a very short second round of just one sentence, I agree or disagree questions. And I'll ask people to stand up if they agree, and then I'll ask people to stand up if they disagree. There will be about four or five of those. And then there'll be a final round of We'll hopefully two minutes each, we'll see how much time we have left, um, in which everybody will be able to say whatever the heck they want to say. Um, it's going to be unstructured, and people can use that for whatever purpose they want. They can introduce themselves more fully than the brochure that you got at the door. They can respond to a question that they weren't asked. Um, they can um, talk about some issue that didn't come up, but I would ask people during that final round to please try to focus as much as they can on the ABC platform and specifically tell us why you think you would be the best candidate to carry out that platform if you were elected. Or if you disagree with it, explain why. Um, any questions about the, the format? That's basically what we're going to do. OK. Um, some scheduling issues for candidates. So as you see, not every seat is filled here. There are good reasons for that. Uh, it's a Tuesday night. So two of our candidates are members of the school committee, namely um, Mayor Simmons and Richard Harding. Uh, so they are hoping to be here later when the school committee meeting breaks. But if they don't show up, that's the reason why. Um, uh, Tim Toomey was hoping to be here, but has, is sick. He has a medical issue, so he can't be here. Uh, Craig Kelly is hoping to be here late. I think I've covered all the, uh, oh, and uh, Harry is uh, also unable to be here. Did I leave anybody out, Jesse? Jesse's going to prompt me when I make mistakes, which is good. Um, 
Okay, there were brochures at the door, I hope everybody got one that has the candidates' pictures on it and a little bit of their responses to the questionnaires. Uh, the full responses to those questionnaires are posted on the ABC website, uh, which is abettercambridge.org. They will be posted by the end of the week, sorry. Um, and I think that's all I have to say by way of introduction. So, um, I, oh, one more thing. I'm gonna ask candidates when they respond to please stand. Um, it's otherwise unfair to the people in the back row who are gonna be obscured. <laughs> so we're gonna ask everybody to uh, stand when they answer. Okay, all right, so. Um, the first question, the first question is going to go to a group consisting of these four people here. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call everybody by their first name. I hope that's not too familiar, but it, I find it easier to do that. So Alana, Sombo, Gwen, and Paul are gonna answer the first question. And here's the first question. How does denser development affect communities of color in Cambridge? And Alana, why don't we start with you? And you have two minutes. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. My name is Alana Mallon, and I'm running for Cambridge City Council. Um, how does density affect communities of color? I think when we uh, prioritize density in certain neighborhoods that are typically communities of color, we are disenabled disabling them to move to different neighborhoods and communities. And that puts them at a disadvantage. It is incumbent on us as city councilors to ensure that residents are able to live across all of our beautiful neighborhoods here in Cambridge. And I'm committed to make sure that that happens here in Cambridge so that our communities of color have access to the same resources that people do in West Cambridge and North Cambridge. Um, I think it's really important for us to understand how these vulnerable communities are placed in, in pockets of our neighborhoods that um, have consistently been low income. And we need to make sure that the future of Cambridge moves beyond that. Thank you. Sumble? Um, so um, I apologize if, if I cough. I, uh, I'm a little bit sick. Uh, hopefully I won't throw up. <laughs> That'd be awful. Um, ooh, sorry for the image. Uh, so I'm going to speak from my own experience. I grew up in Cambridge Public Housing. Uh, what I liked about uh, the housing development that I grew up in, well, first it was Range Towers. That um, had a lot of problems, but we moved to Roosevelt Towers. And what I liked was the community feel. Um, I worry that when we do get more dense, um, as much as it creates hiding, ha more housing, we have to do a lot of thinking about the families that are moving in and the sense of community they feel. Um, we have a big problem with, and I've heard this because I've canvassed, um, they don't feel like they have a place for their children. Um, they don't feel connected to their neighbors. Uh, so, you know, that is something we have to really be conscious about. We have to think about the ownership units too. Are we... Is it more rental? Can we have more ownership units in these buildings so that more people are, are staying and there's a stronger sense of community? Um, I loved the housing development I grew up in because we we're all connected through a backyard. Um, in larger development, that's much harder, but I think the city can do more with adding open space, for example. So that's what I'll add. I think it affects communities of color because they're who are they are who are moving into some of these more affordable units that our um, denser developments are um, giving, so. Thank you. Um, Gwen. Hi everyone, my name is Gwen Volmar. I'm thrilled to be here with you tonight. I'm running for city council. I'm asking for your number one vote on November 7th. Uh, so in talking about density, I wanna draw from a couple of different sources. Uh, first is the experience of many of my friends who have Section 8 vouchers, who have been trying to find housing. Uh, the statistic that I have heard is that 90% of our vouchers for the city of Cambridge go uh, expired because those people just simply cannot find housing. And so there is a certain element of uh, increasing the density that we have that will create housing that is otherwise not available for people who are ready to pay and who have lives existing in Cambridge and families existing in Cambridge uh, who want to be here and are ready to move in. 
That said, when we build and when building happens, it's incredibly important that we be able to maintain community in those spaces. Oftentimes, when we build up and higher, obviously because of the way that the space works, there isn't increased amount of retail that exists. There is only the square footage of the bottom of that building for retail, right? Which means we don't do things like when we bring in people, additional schools, additional cafes, additional places for them to shop. So we have to be able to, in addition to increasing our density, be able to create places for those people to have community. We have to make it so that a place like Christina's ice cream is not being forced to anchor a giant 10 story building that maybe only a luxury restaurant really has the ability to anchor. We have to be able to create places for people in those communities Communities to feel like they are home, including green spaces, including schools, including small scale kinds of shops. And that is primarily what affects communities of color who feel marginalized, who feel displaced, and eventually leave if they can't feel at home here. That absolutely has to be our priority. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paul? Hi, uh, Paul Turner, candidate for City Council. I don't have too much different to add other than I, I do agree uh, that we need to make sure that all of our communities uh, take on uh, the challenge of building more housing, that there shouldn't be one or two or three sections of the city that are getting all the dense housing. But if we're really going to be able to uh, provide more housing options for all of our residents, uh, we need to have more density. And in order to resolve some of the issues that people have ra uh, raised, in, in that development, we have to make sure that we build in plenty of community space, plenty of green space. Uh, I would really like to see more mixed income, mixed use uh, uh, developments uh, being developed because that's the only way to build a stronger community and to make sure that everybody has uh, the access and advantages that we see across the city in different neighborhoods. So I'm, I do believe that we need uh, greater density uh, in order to be able to develop the housing uh, that we uh, need in order to support all of our families and provide options for po uh, people in Cambridge. And I think we can ameliorate the negative impacts uh, by uh, you know, good planning and making sure uh, that uh, the people that live there have access to all the opportunities that we have in Cambridge. Thank you. Uh, before we turn to the next group, I forgot to say a couple things. First of all, I didn't come up with these questions all by myself. Uh, the ABC board was uh, helpful and a lot of you uh, submitted questions through a sort of crowdsourcing uh, phenomenon on the ABC website. So thanks to all of you who did it and hopefully you'll see some of your questions in the mix here. Um, secondly, um, in case you haven't noticed, uh, we're being televised here by CCTV and uh, that will be uh, going up on their Facebook page, I believe, is that right? And also eventually on ABC's page. So uh, look for it there and uh, feel free to tell all your friends to look for it. So when I, when I was a candidate, I always used to wonder how many people who showed up for these candidates' nights were already committed to somebody and whether I was just talking into the void. Uh, but I can safely say that uh, there'll be lots of people watching you on TV who haven't made up their minds. And so that's a good thing, I think, for all of us. So um, the second group is going to consist of people over here on the right front, namely Sam, Mark, Jeff, and Dennis. And we're also going to th uh, throw Dan into that group as well in the second row, because um, we don't want him to feel left out. Uh, uh, sure. Sam, Mark, Jeff, Dennis, and Dan. OK? And, and here's your. Here's your question. Should Cambridge zoning continue to require parking minimums? And if so, to what extent and why? There's a nice, easy question for you. Are you starting with me? Uh, yeah. OK, all right. So hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Samuel Gebru. I'm a candidate for city council. Uh, I don't think that we should continue to require parking minimums. I'll give you one example. Uh, not too long ago, earlier this summer, I toured an affordable housing development called Putnam Green, which is on in my neighborhood of Cambridgeport on Putnam Avenue. And uh, it's built by Homeowners Rehab. It's a wonderful facility, 40 units that are all affordable. They were given um, 
uh, an, an exemption to have 75% of their requirement. And they, since 2012, when the uh, uh, project uh, became online, they have yet to fill maximum occupancy in this parking garage. Parking spots are very expensive, and I don't think that we should be requiring uh, some of these projects to have uh, parking minimums. And I'm more interested in figuring out how can we, for instance, if I'm going to waive a parking requirement, how can we leverage that waiver for more affordable housing? houses uh, for more units or uh, for developers to pay into the Affordable Housing Trust or some other uh, trade-off. Uh, I think that we should be focused on transit-oriented housing. I think we should be focused on uh, making sure that people are using other modes to, to, um, to go around the city, and that is the case. Over half of our population uses other means than a car to travel around, uh, especially to go to work. So I don't think that we should be requiring these parking minimums. Thank you. Mark? Thank you. Um, wow, parking and traffic, if I could solve those, uh, those were quite, I think I'd be a billionaire. Um, my name is Mark McGovern, I'm running for re-election to the City Council and respectfully asking for your number one vote on November 7th. Uh, I would agree um, with Sam on a, on a number of points. I think uh, parking, uh, the cost of adding parking spaces, and especially even if they're, if they're underground parking spaces to developments is outrageously expensive and that is money that uh, could be used uh, to produce more affordable housing or to bring down the cost of the development. Um, especially when we're talking about building developments around transit hubs. Uh, we want to uh, support and increase uh, people's ability to take public transportation, um, walk to work, walk to, walk to school, walk to, to shop. Um, you know, we have, um, as Sam pointed out, that many of the parking spaces go uh, unused. And there's a couple of reasons for that, but w one is that there, it's an additional cost on, added onto your rent. It doesn't come with the unit. So a lot of the folks who live in inclusionary units aren't able to afford their low income by that's why they're in those units. They can't afford those, those, those spaces. But we also have an ordinance that doesn't allow uh, developers to rent those spaces to other people in the neighborhood um, who, live, uh, who don't live in their building. So you have these empty spaces that are just sitting there, um, and then people in the, in the neighborhood who might want one of those spaces can't even access those spaces. So it's really a waste. Um, it's a waste of space. It's a waste of money. Um, you know, we can, and we've done this in some projects, we have negotiated with, with developers to provide Charlie cards for their residents, to provide Zipcar memberships for their residents, um, to provide, make sure that we have bike lockers where people can safely lock up their bikes. So there's a lot of things that we can do other than parking and reducing parking and reducing cars uh, should be one of our goals. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. Not the greatest night to be out, so I appreciate you here. To all those at CCTV. My name is Jeff Santos. I'm a candidate for city council. And I thought about parking, and it's interesting because I've got uh, two parking tickets in the last two weeks. Um, here, here's a story. We, and I talk to business owners all the time, particularly small business owners, we need more parking spaces. It's, it's that simple. People who come into the city, particularly those who want to get in small business, need to get to park. There are business owners who come from Somerville or Boston. They're just trying to find a place to park. There are people who can't afford the parking space, and I include myself in one of those high-rise buildings. So we need more spaces. Now, at the same time, and I agree with what Mark said, I've worked very closely with people like Mike Dukakis and John Bussinger, who's in the audience tonight, about North-South Station railing project about reforming the MBTA. And if we were to do the Volpe project, I would like to see the owners of MIT and whoever else is going to partner with them to be able to subsidize those folks who hit the affordable housing 20% to be able to have a subsidized T-pass. I think it has to be a comprehensive strategy. So if you want to limit, if you want to increase, I think all of it has to be able to hit where people are. So we're talking about people who live in the buildings, people who are visiting small businesses, people who are visiting friends. Nobody wants to come outside and see their car towed. Nobody wants to get a parking ticket. So we need to work on this together. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Dennis. Thank you, Jeff. 
Hi, I'm Dennis Carlone. I'm seeking uh, re-election as well. Um, this is an interesting question. A typical parking space underground costs sixty to a hundred thousand dollars. It's big money. Um, on the other hand, um, we have to realize that we're in a transition. Younger people don't need cars as much as older folks. Some people are handicapped, and they absolutely should have access to a car. Uh, it, a lot of things really come into question, uh, as has been mentioned, a distance from transit. Um, I'm, I'm an urban designer. In the ideal world, everybody walks. That's what makes a city vibrant. Uh, but that is not an ideal world. Um, when the shopping center in East Cambridge wanted to build 3,000 parking spaces, we, I was doing design review in the master plan, we said, no way. The neighborhood insisted they all get built. And they lay empty, I might add, on the third level down. Um, unfortunately, banks and financing of housing look for parking. They're reducing their numbers, but that's part of the deal because they have to consider what happens if the project goes under. It won't go under in Cambridge, but in general. So they want to be sure that they can rent it and they can sell it. So it's a more complex issue than just yes or no. Um, so a transit upgrade is absolutely key, and uh, some of us have been advocating for the city to assist in shuttles, adding shuttles, those missing links, uh, connecting Inman Square uh, to other parts of the city. So again, thank you, Dennis Carlone. I would love your number one vote. Thank you. Um, Dan, in the back row. Oh, you have a mic on the ground, Dan. Yeah, I've got a friend with a mic. I only need one. I'm delighted to be here with you and with everyone here. You're so wonderful. And we're going to make good, good we're really going to make progress. Uh, all of us, you know, you know, not all of us are going to win. Okay? Uh, but we need the help of, of all the people running and not to lose, not to lose uh, interest. Uh, because you're, we're going to need your competencies who, to, to move forward. This, it's not easy to get, to get the work done that we need to. Um, okay, in parking, here. Everything here, everything that was said here was true. Okay, so it's complicated. So, right, we live in the real world. But we can address it. We're learning that, particularly in Cambridge, where we're at the forefront of research, we're learning to get into the micro or the nano of, of feeding and, 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 and um, addressing. And that's what we do with real people. We talk to each person as who she is or who they are. And that's how we, I, I, I advocate we work with the parking. It's not one answer. It's many answers. And each, each application or each development requires that some uh, forum within the city council Address each one. Take the time with the inspectional services to see that we're being appropriate to the people who are living there or are going to live there. Uh, we have the right ideas, we, we, and, we have the, we, and we've spoken to the, the needs, of the real needs of people with cars, people without cars, people with disabilities, people without money. We can solve this because people can solve anything we are determined to solve. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you in that round. Uh, another thing I forgot to mention is that uh, at the last minute, we asked candidates not to bring props with them. One candidate uh, was going to exhibit some signs. And we appreciate the fact that uh, we didn't really clarify the rules about that in advance. But um, at the last minute, we decided not to uh, encourage that. So. Um, anybody who did bring props can, um, can demonstrate them outside, and we encourage you to look at them on your way out. <laughs> so thanks for that. Okay, our third group is going to consist of um, Vatsidi, am I pronouncing that right? Uh, Brian, 
Greg in the back row, and in the front row, Jan and Nadia. Um, so five of you in this, and your question is going to be this one. Um, Cambridge is part of a large metropolitan area that shares many of our housing, zoning, and environmental problems. How should Cambridge cooperate with surrounding communities and the state government to solve these problems? And Vatsidi, we'll start with you. It's a little unfair to the first person in each group because you get surprised by the question and the others have a chance to think, but we'll make up for it in the next round when you can say whatever the heck you want to. So go ahead. Hi, I'm Vatsidi Sivangsai. I'm running for Cambridge City Council for the very first time. I'm really excited to be in this space um, again, and I'm excited to be here with you and all of our candidates. Uh, I have been working across the region on how we can solve and find multifaceted approaches to the housing crisis in this region. Considering um, our infrastructure and the issues of our environment. It takes many, many, many people with very, very diverse perspectives to find solutions that are gonna work for our diverse communities across Massachusetts. So I'm just gonna um, kind of give you a little bit of a snapshot of what we have been doing. In the last um, four or five years, I've been working with uh, city, city Life. I've been working with Chinese Progressive Association, and I have been working with Right to the City on creating a model to protect affordable housing for renters. It took us more than half a year to get there. We worked as um, government and tenant advocates and also um, as attorneys to find this this contract and negotiation that allowed rent to rise just a little bit so that people could stay in their homes. This is something that we can do as individuals, as advocates, as governments. We can spread this across Massachusetts. In addition to that, we should have regional collaboration, um, convenings that we can talk about, uh, housing, just, uh, just cause evictions. We can talk about zoning. We can talk, talk about infrastructure and how to really um, preserve uh, our infrastructure to be a public good and to remain a public good, right? So my answer is, is that we need more communities involved in this discussion in order to prevent displacement and in order to work collaboratively on these huge challenges we face. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Um, Brian. Good evening, my name is Brian Sutton. Uh, thank you all for coming here. I hope uh, to get your vote this fall. So the, uh, that's it. you're right, the, the, this is an issue that is ongoing, it affects the whole state, it affects the whole country, and it's not slowing down, if anything, it's gaining momentum. And it's not isolated at Cambridge, they're, you know, Boston, Somerville, seeing the exact same thing. W what we really need to do is be very specific, quantitative with our targets, have specific number targets and scorecards for ourselves that we can look at quarterly. If we get our neighbors on the same platform, you know, working with the same initiatives, they're all rowing in the same direction, we all work with the same scorecard, it becomes really easy to match ourselves where other people, their initiatives are doing better, affecting the, you know, the bottom line is more affordable housing. They're, whatever they're doing is doing better, what we're doing is doing better. Uh, collectively, we will do much better than any individual city can do. So it, it, it is imperative that we work together. And I, I think it's not just, you know, we definitely need to talk regularly with the other uh, cities, but it's more than that. We need to specifically grade ourselves with quantitative scorecard type measurements that are open to the public, uh, reviewed quarterly in an inclusive manner. So again, Brian Sutton, I hope for your vote this fall. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, hello, my name is Greg Morey and I'm standing for city councilship. So we need to tackle all these issues at the same time. We have, we have a diversity and a, a housing units at Volpe site Everybody wants to have affordable housing. We have to divide them up evenly. We have parking uh, situations here. Well, why don't we offer the, you know, the units to people without automobiles? Just reduce the automobiles. We need the units 
This is a bike city. This is a walk city. We need green space. So it's going to take a lot of people to come together with great ideas. We're going to put them in a box, and we're all going to vote on them. Now, that's the best we can do right now. Um, we, the, MIT is, um, the students of MIT is asking for 1,800 units. How can we put 1,800 cars in Kendall Square? I don't think we can do that. We're going to be in traffic jams forever. So the ones that don't have automobiles, maybe they should get the, fair crack, the first cracks of these, auto, these apartments. Makes sense to me. And we have to divide these units up with all the nationalities we have in, in the city of Cambridge. We have so many different nationalities in Cambridge, we have to divide these apartments up evenly. I mean, you can't go against one group and against another group. There's going to be a riot going on. So it's common sense decisions. It's going to take all neighborhood groups to come together. Many debates, many solutions, many ideas. It's going to go on for two years. We won't be building there for two years from now, probably. But um, I'm standing with the neighborhood groups. I'm standing with all the people with common sense. And with no automobiles, we don't need any more automobiles. We need more bikes and more bike lanes and green space and clean air and clean water. So I'm open, up for, I'm open for any ideas and solutions. Um, we have a long history of public service in the city of Cambridge. My uncle wrote the Bill of Rights with Franklin Roosevelt, the second Bill of Rights. So I just wanted to add that. I'm, a city count I'm running as a city councilor. My time is up, and thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Jan, you're next. Hi, thank you. My name's Jan Devereaux, and I'm running for re-election. And I'd like to thank former Councillor Sullivan for moderating this and to mention that back in the 80s, there was no Facebook and no internet. So maybe people were sitting at home watching, but um, I hope more people are watching online tonight. Um, all of these issues that you mention, um, housing, the environment, zoning, and traffic, I can't remember whether that was in the question, are obviously interrelated and are obviously regional problems. And I think um, Cambridge does a terrific job of studying these problems here in Cambridge, and it's easy to overlook the fact that these are regional problems and that our municipal governors governance system doesn't really um, incentivize collaboration. In fact, it pits communities against each other. And we've seen that time and again. Um, I come from uh, the west side of town um, near the Alewife area. And um, communities on that side of town, Belmont and Arlington, um, are struggling to meet their affordable housing needs. So um, we've had uh, developments, 40B developments, the Silver Maple Forest on the floodplain that was tremendously difficult. That is providing some affordable housing. It also uh, took away a lot of trees that are very important uh, for flooding issues in that a highly vulnerable area. Right across Route 2, we see the Mugar Woods being contested by the neighborhood there. Those communities don't have the commercial base we have, so they're struggling to think about how to accommodate housing. And then I'll talk about traffic very briefly. Route 2, 80% of the traffic that streams through those rotaries is coming from someplace outside of Cambridge and ending up someplace outside of Cambridge. And we cannot solve these problems alone. We need to collaborate better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nadia, right next to you. I would totally stand in support of everything Jan just said. And to add to that as well, I think that there are other opportunities that we can continue to work together with the neighboring regions, but then also with the state as well. Um, regarding transportation, it's anywhere from clearing up traffic um, in the roads that go through our regions, but also in the way of public transportation as well. Um, public transportation, we are seeing that there is a lot of traffic of people who are either living in Somerville or living in Boston and obviously using a lot of the lines to come and work in Cambridge or um, come enjoy what the city has to offer as well. And I think that there is a lot of opportunities to work together and we're already seeing that come into place um, as we start to work on creating more frequent trips um, and create more access to technology to track a lot of the public transportation as well. In terms of working with the state, I think that our transportation department can be working with the state more to create opportunities to subsidize tickets um, and Charlie cards for students here especially, for low income students especially. Um, on the housing affordability side, for me, as a candidate for city council, I really want to push forward not only building more affordable units, but building more affordable neighborhoods. And I think that's a big opportunity where we not only work within Cambridge, but work with 
making this an affordable place to live and opening up opportunities, whether those be grocery stores or arts and culture access. And I think that's something we can work across lines as well. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna add the point on graduate students. Uh, we are home to some of the largest and most well-endowed universities here. Um, they're not going anywhere. Right now, over 55% of graduate students are living off of campus, um, and that's both in Cambridge, um, but also in the neighboring regions as well. And I think that there are a lot of opportunities to push universities to to meet more of the demand for graduate students, because um, right now about 10,000 units in Cambridge are taken up uh, for short-term rentals for graduate students that could otherwise be long-term solutions for Cambridge families. Thank you. So our last group, unless someone else shows up, <laughs> is going to be uh, the folks in the left front here, and they are Olivia, Craig, Quinton, Adrian, and Sean. And um, here's going to be your question. Um, should the city restrict or prevent new residential development in low-lying areas, such as most of the port, East Cambridge, Cambridge Port, and Alewife, because they will inevitably be flooded by a five-foot sea level rise? Um, please explain. Uh, a little different, Olivia. Hi, my name is Olivia. Uh, of my colleagues here, I'm the only candidate with an arts background and professional nonprofit arts management leadership skills. As such, I am consistently stepping outside of my comfort zone to learn about and address other issues, and this moment is no exception. <laughs> Thank you. So in the recent weeks, we have seen what has happened to other cities in our country when they have disregarded the uh, environmental benefits that are brought by certain kinds of terrain, right? Other cities in our country right now are experiencing enormous suffering because they decided to overlook the fact that the natural resources that they had could have protected them from the disasters that they are now enduring. I don't see any reason why we should go down that same road. It seems insane. Cambridge is deserving of a development plan that honors what is special about it. And if we develop without thinking about it, we will not only potentially put ourselves in harm's way, we will cannibalize the very set of characteristics that makes this place so desirable in the first place. Thanks. <laughs> um, Craig. Thank you very much. My name is Craig Kelly. I appreciate you all being here. This could not be a more timely question. Obviously, we've had two hurricanes in the southeast recently. There's a Cat 5 as we speak getting ready to devastate Puerto Rico. These threats and challenges are real. The way to address them is not to say no. The way to address them is to say, here's what these challenges present where we are. And there's an awful lot of study, insurance companies and so forth, that says this is how you can, in fact, build safely in wherever it happens to be. Alewife, when we build an alewife, we add flood storage. Because right now, alewife is pretty much impermeable. When we build an area four, we don't. Both of those places have a type of flood risk. We can meet that flood risk, not necessarily by restricting housing. These areas are generally developed already or resist restricting other types of development, but by insisting that the development meet the strict criteria to be safe for the inhabitants and the visitors. There's an awful lot of new technology in terms of flood proofing, fire proofing, storm proofing, and so forth. That's what we should do. The world is moving towards cities. We may or may not like it, but they're moving towards cities and they're moving towards coastal cities. That flies in the face of what we know long-term is going to happen with sea level rise, with storm surges and so forth. In the immediate future, we need to buffer for that demographic shift towards coastal cities. As time moves on, honestly, we're gonna start thinking of a retreat from the sea. That is a huge, huge thing for people to grasp. And in the interim, while we try and wrestle with that, we're going to have to put people safely in these places. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Quinton. My name is Quinton Zondervan. I'm a first-time candidate for Cambridge City Council. 
Thank you for being here and for listening to us. Uh, many of you probably know me as a climate activist. I've served for almost a decade on the Climate Protection Action Committee that advises the city of Cambridge on climate policy. I grew up in Suriname in South America where we've learned over the many uh, thousands of years that people have been living there how to live with nature. So we build homes on stilts so that when it floods, the water rushes underneath. And then when the water recedes, we just go back to our regular lives. In Florida, uh, the Federal Emergency Management uh, FEMA regulation requires that we build at eight feet above sea level. So uh, Eckerd College, where I did my undergraduate, when we build new buildings there, they are eight feet above uh, mean sea level. We just recently, uh, I was presented with, with a study that the city of Cambridge had initiated as part of the vulnerability assessment and the climate change adaptation planning that showed that we could reduce our flood risk significantly by using green infrastructure. We have a lot of pavement that we don't need in this city. If we replace that pavement with green infrastructure, with plants, with swales, with some of these approaches, we can reduce our flood risk and uh, make the, the whole city safer for, for all of us in the face of climate change. So to answer your question directly, no, it's not about restricting where people can live. As, as some of my colleagues have said earlier, it's about being smart and doing the developments in a way that accommodates uh, the threats. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian. So the question specifically, well, sorry. My name's Adrian Musgrave, and I'm respectfully asking for your number one vote this November. Um, so the question really highlights the port community area, which doesn't have to imagine if a major flood event happens in the future. Because in 2010, we had um, significant amount of rainfall. And if you were in the city at that time, you'll probably remember that if you were in the port, um, there was flooding that stayed for days where it was all the way up to the, the half level of a car. Um, we've been talking about this since the 90s, and it's only now this year that we have been able to put some funding behind the infrastructure that would allow us to deal with the stormwater. I think for our city what this really highlights is the fact that for our communities where we have more than 20% of our residents who are living in concentrated and persistent poverty, we often don't put enough focus and funding in them so that they can live full, happy lives and truly reach their potential. And so on city council, that's a top focus of mine, um, making sure that everyone in the port has a safe house that they can live in and good community spaces that children can go to and play in. On the climate side, I also wanna highlight that the city over many years has done some excellent uh, leading reports on what we should do. And so as a city, we know exactly what we should do. We have net zero, we have climate um, vulnerability assessment report, we have um, our Envision Cambridge Climate and Environment Working Group. We have so many of our talented community members working on the plans. We now need a city council who's going to put them into action, and that's another pledge that I make. Adrian Musgrave, I would be honored to have your number one vote in November. Thank you. Thank you. Sean? Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Tierney, uh, also a first-time candidate. Uh, I grew up over in West Cambridge and now live over in the Cambridgeport neighborhood, the corner of Magazine and Prince Street. Um, you know, I work in housing. I'm the research director for the State Housing Committee, working on affordable housing for the state of Massachusetts. And a lot of times in the housing community, we find ourselves at odds with environmentalists and get into these fights about, well, we need to build more housing, well, we need to protect the environment. And a lot of times we see in the suburbs, you know, the environmental argument being used as a pretext to stop housing. And it's, it's encouraging to hear folks here talk about the need to improve the environment and make our housing develop more environmentally friendly in the context of building more housing, because that's what we need to do is increase the supply to meet the demand regionally and have the city of Cambridge be a leader on that. Um, as far as tangible things that I could offer, um, I put out a housing plan on my website, seantierney.org, and what I lead with is 
this tool called 40R, which is an overlay district for zoning. And what it allows you to do is to create areas in the city where you can build denser, and you get state reimbursements for that, and you get school, school cost reimbursements for that. But more importantly, it allows you to access funds like the MassWorks Infrastructure Program, which is a $500 million fund through the state that you can use to build sewers, do curb cuts, figure out ways to you know, go through that impervious surfaces to get the rainwater to come through and, and really mitigate a lot of these environmental concerns as we look to build denser in our community. Um, and I'll say also, I've been to the Central Square Advisory Committee meetings where we talk about running the sewer from the port to the Charles, going over Mass Ave. That's an important project that we need to work on to alleviate some of those issues with the flooding that Adrian spoke about. And um, you know, it's a tough issue, and I think we can come together and work on it as environmentalists and as housing advocates. So thank you for taking time to listen to me. I'm Sean Tierney. Uh, vote me number one. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks to all the candidates for some really thoughtful answers to that, in that round. Um, so we've got two rounds left. Uh, the next round is going to be pretty short, and it's going to be a sort of lightning round in which I'm going to read you a series of statements, and I'm going to ask people who agree to stand up first, and then I'm going to ask people who disagree to stand up second. Now, you might think some of these are unfair, and you're entitled to think that. And if you do, you can say so in the next round, which is going to be your opportunity to say whatever you want. Um, so, you know, that's the way it's going to be. Now, the first of these is going to be the only factual question I'm going to ask tonight. So this, unlike every other question I'm asking, this one has a right answer and a wrong answer. <laughs> and not only that, I'm going to tell you what it is after you have your chance to say whether you agree or disagree. <laughs> This was not my idea. I blame the entire ABC board for this. <laughs> OK. So here's the factual question of the night. Even, you have to say whether you agree or disagree. Even in Cambridge, if it's true, false. Agree or disagree? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll call on you after I read it. And you can, if, you, if, you say, if you think it's true, you'll stand up. And then if you think it's false, you can stand up after that. OK. Even in Cambridge, more workers drove alone to work than walked to work in 2015. I'll read it one more time, because I know you're, you're going to want to get this right. Even in Cambridge, more workers drove alone to work, so not carpooling, not mass transit, dro driving alone to work, than walked to work in 2015, which is the last year we have data from MAPC. So who thinks that statement is true? More people walked. More people drove alone to work than walked to work. Does, wait, does public transportation count as walking? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> drove alone versus walked. Those are the questions. Okay, how many thinks that statement is false? Okay. Is somebody standing twice? No. <laughs> Remember, this is all going to be. This is all going to be on TV. So, all right. The answer is, it's false. According, although you'll see there's a little wrinkle here. Uh, according to MAPC data, 31.2% of Cambridge workers walked to work. And I'll read you the rest. 28.6% used public transportation. 28.4% drove alone, which is less than 31.2. 7% biked. And 3.8% carpooled. But here's the wrinkle. Walking to work includes walking from one room of your house to the other room of your house. <laughs> and 7.4% of the people did that. So you're all right, OK? Everybody is right. <laughs> and that's the only factual question. All right, everything else is an opinion question. So I'm not going to tell you whether you're right or wrong. This is, this is kind of fun. OK, uh, I, got, I got four of these questions. So again, I'm going to ask you agree and then disagree. First question. First statement, Cambridge needs more bike lanes, even if that means reducing car parking spaces. How many people agree? OK. Uh, save your applause. Uh, how many people disagree? Please sit down. How many people disagree? Please stand. OK, you're a brave man, Jeff. Good work. Um, no, no right answer here. All right, second, second statement. Building more market rate housing 
while requiring a percentage of affordable units, is an important way to address Cambridge's housing problems. So I'll read it again. Building more market rate housing while requiring a percentage of affordable units is an important way to address Cambridge's housing problems. Stand if you agree. Okay. Please. I, I cannot explain. I can, I, uh, this could take us the rest of the evening. You can, you can, you can ask that question during the next round, though. Uh, okay, please sit down. Uh, how many disagree? Okay, thank you. And how many are abstaining? <laughs> All right, okay, you can abstain. <laughs> you can abstain. I just didn't see everybody stand. Okay, that's great, thank you. I got uh, two more of these. Building more and denser market rate housing will drive out lower income residents in surrounding neighborhoods. Reading it again. Building more and denser market rate housing will drive out lower income residents in surrounding neighborhoods. Who agrees? Okay. And who disagrees? Okay, we finally found one that there's a fairly equal balance on, so that's a good sign. Thank you all very much. Uh, last question in this round. Um, this is more along the same lines, which won't surprise you at, at this ABC event. Um, given the choice, between a new 10-unit housing development in which half the units, so five units, are affordable, and a 50-unit development in which 10 units are affordable and the rest market rate, I would pick the 10-unit development. Okay, so we're comparing, I'll read this again. There's a choice between a new 10-unit housing development in which half the units, namely five, are affordable and a 50 unit development in which 10 units are affordable and the rest, 40, are market rate. Uh, and, the, and the statement is, I would pick the 10 unit development. So, everybody understand? Okay, stand if you would pick the 10 unit development. <coughs> okay, well, that's, that's good. Uh, St I'm all right, that's all right, but I'll, I'll ask for abstention. Stand if you disagree. Stand if you would agree, stand if you would pick Stand if you would pick the 50-unit development. <laughs> okay, and uh, okay, you can you can explain anything you want in the next round, and uh, please sit. And those who want to abstain, yeah, you can stand. Very good, and you can explain why in just a minute. Okay, well, that, that that's very interesting, and and that question also I think provi provided some interesting fodder for discussion, which I hope will come next. So we're now going to go to our last round, um, which I think two minutes is going to be OK, right? So we're going to give everybody two minutes. Uh, you can say whatever you want. You can further introduce yourself. But I would encourage you to focus on um, the ABC platform, which some of which was the focus of some of the questions I've just been asking. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it. You can say you disagree with it, or you can say it's more complicated than that, and here are some other considerations. Um, but I would like not to wander too far from the issues of housing development and zoning, um, because that's what tonight's forum is all about. Sound OK? So I think this time, we will just go from left to right and start in the back row. Um, so Alana, I'm going to. All right. We'll start on the right then. How about that? Um, so, uh, Dan, I will ask you to go first. Uh, two minutes uh, once again, and uh, thank you, okay, thank you again you all for being. Plus, we want you to be on TV. All right. So I stood alone a moment ago, but I hope to bring all of you with me, uh, with with careful listening, and uh, and correspondence and attention to, to what we're facing. So development, who are we developing for? Who needs the development? Am, am I in a, um, a, a sympathetic uh, audience here? Um, the people of Cambridge? Cambridge is becoming, everyone who lives here see, sees it. Um, Identical, in fact, there are squares 
in which you could ask, where am I? Am I is this Cambridge? Do I recognize this as Cambridge? Even Harvard Square. Uh, you could be in, in, in Providence, forgive me, or Singapore. And that doesn't make us a world-class city. That makes us uh, responsive to market forces. Thank you, President Trump and all his band. What's, what's wonderful in Cambridge and wonderful about all, all of us here is that we're individuals and we can work in community. And that's delightful and that's human. Uh, respectfully, I propose that we put those values not just first, uh, uh, determinative in we, when we consider development. Development, we live here for the people who live here. If we, not for the folks who are very skillfully, it's their business, making, making more money than they need from the so-called development. Sure, development as we choose it to be can, can be wonderful, but let's do it with a, a determination in mind of what we want this city to be, or uh, else Dan, we won't have me. it anymore. Excuse It'll me, go away. your time is and up. And I'm going away. Thank you. <laughs> we don't want you to go away. Greg. <clears throat> Um, hello, my name is Greg Morey, and I'm standing for the city council. <clears throat> so we have a lot of issues on the table right now, which is housing, affordable housing, diversity, different nationalities, bikes, and bike lanes. We can do all that at one time. With the Volpe site, and there's a site in Brattle Square there, um, we, the government has to provide uh, housing it's, um, they have to provide it, and it has to come from the government. The government's got to set the rule, and MIT got to follow it, follow the rules, and Harvard's got to follow the rules. And the students at MIT want 1,800 units affordable housing at MIT Volpe site. And what's affordable? Is it 30,000 or 50,000? Um, that would be the bracket. There's probably about 190 different nationalities, and they all want their rights protected. So um, you're going to have to provide those units to them as well. So maybe we can provide units to people without automobiles. That makes sense. There's a lot of people without automobiles. Maybe they'll be the first crack at it. Maybe, maybe people will give up their automobiles to get these units. You need the units. We don't need the automobiles. So we have to put that together. We have to put jobs, too. Make sure you write down job internships, jobs for our youth, youth, youth apprenticeship programs. Um, it's got to be mandatory because we're not getting enough jobs for the kids and we need more units. And my name is Greg Morey, vote for Greg Morey, and um, my family has a big history of public service, federal government, state government, and my name is Greg Morey and Joe Sakey wrote the second Bill of Rights with Franklin Roosevelt. He certainly did. Thank you. Brian. Thanks again for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Sutton, BrianSutton.org. I'm running for city council. Uh, again, this this issue it, it needs to be looked at. It needs to be measured closely uh, with very specific numbers. We need to look at just the not just the quantity of affordable housing sales, which are going down the last few years of new condos, and um, how much affordable housing is being lost, how many is being gained. Um, I'm a, an engineer by trade and by degree, and I, I'm Six Sigma certified. What I do is I work with numbers. I've been doing this for a long time. I'll bring you examples. So we talked about um, parking. So for me, it's about numbers, right? So for parking, in the last six years, population has gone up 5% here. Uh, new development has gone up 6%. The price of rental has gone up 36%. The price of a single condo has got about 48% in the same time period. So it's a no-brainer. I mean, where the focus should be, one is obviously outpacing the other. And uh, we just, we got to look at numbers. We got to keep checking ourselves. And we have to focus our direction and our energy um, based on that. So my name is Brian Sutton. Again, I appreciate your number one vote. Thanks. Thank you. Vlad um, City. Vatsidi. Hi, I'm Vatsidi Sivangsai. 
Um, I want to dive in a little bit deeper about um, the affordable housing and stability and infrastructure and density in this um, entire metro region. I am running on a platform that really looks at how do we bring um, more diverse voices to the table. And diverse voices to me are, is everyone, right? But in particularly, those voices that are often underrepresented. So that means low-income folks, women, seniors, folks with disability, young families, hardworking individuals, immigrants. What we often find is that housing policies in throughout the country, and even on our region, has left these behind and have often created policies that people think is best for those folks that are, are left behind. And I think that you guys all know this, right? Redlining, housing programs, everything. So what I want to focus on is that when we look at market rate and we're looking at affordability, we're asking who's getting those affordable housing? Is it the families that need it? Is it the moderate to middle income families? When we're looking at density, where are our lower income folks going? Are they going to one place? Is it real mixed housing? Is it really mixed use areas where they can access the services and the goods that we all really want in transit? When we're looking at that percentage of 50 to 10 and 10 to 5, I picked 10 to 5 because I want a higher percentage of affordable housing. I think that as a region and as a city, we can push for it. And I really believe that Cambridge can lead. So I want us to work together. Let's look at opportunities for us to lead. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Hi, Paul Toner. I hope you'll consider giving me your number one vote in November. Um, David earlier uh, said that this would be the time to make the pitch on why you're the best person for city council. If your only issue is housing, then I have to freely admit there are several people up here who are much more expert on the issue of housing and development than I am. Uh, but I do have the benefit of being married to an expert on housing and development. So I have direct access to all the expertise I need. And any good husband knows you listen to your wife and uh, you go from there. Um, so that's, that's that. My expertise is in education and higher education and working with labor and human resources. And those are the, uh, uh, the talents and skills I think I bring. I also bring the skill of being able to work with a broad, diverse group of people and try to reach consensus and common sense solutions. I'm very much somebody who's focused on uh, solutions rather than finger pointing. Uh, I think we need to move forward and not have it be developer versus environmentalists versus uh, housing advocates. I think that there's room for all of us to work together and that's what I would like to do with uh, if I'm elected to the city council. Uh, I would also just like to take my, my time to respond to the two uh, quickie questions. Uh, I will say on the bike lanes, I very much support uh, increasing the number of bike lanes in order to provide safe passage through the city for bikes and uh, everybody else. My, my son's 12 years old. I want him to be able to ride from North Cambridge to the high school uh, in two years when he starts as a freshman at, at Ringe and Latin so that I can feel confident that he can get there. I didn't feel that confidence for my daughter. But I will say this. Uh, this is a hot issue that we need to re-engage on. Uh, it's the number one issue I get asked on the doorstep. Uh, we really need to sit down uh, both bicyclists and uh, small businesses and uh, some of the communities that have had some bike lanes put in and re-engage in the conversation and think about some solutions because it's become quite polarizing and I'd like to end the polarization. Uh, on the 5010 uh, issue, uh, the 50 unit, truthfully, it depends on the neighborhood. I'm not going to say put a 50 unit house in, in you know, certain neighborhoods, uh, but you know, I think it's the context. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Gwen. Thank you all for your attention. We really appreciate it up here with so many of us. Again, my name is Gwen Volmar. I am really happy to be with you tonight. I'm asking for your vote on November 7th. What I want you to know is that what I value in the people who represent me is personal, genuine experience. I have lived in the same 500 square feet that I lived in 10 years ago when I moved in as a poor, young, broke person because I can't afford to move. My husband and I have had the conversations where we have had to decide what are we going to give up so that we can stay in Cambridge. That has included meals out, that has included vacations, and that has included children because we want to be here and we can't afford it otherwise. We absolutely know 
the incentives that exist for developers to come and ask for special privileges from our city council. It happens in our city, it happens in every other city in this country. What they do is they come and ask for a zoning variance so that they don't have to follow the good systems that we have put in place to really bridle development so that we can take advantage of it. What they will do is ask to pay a fee to support affordable housing somewhere else in the city. That's literal marginalization. We absolutely cannot let that happen. That's how we build buildings that can only be supported by luxury restaurants and not by grocery stores and small shops. That's how people of color and marginalized communities don't feel like they belong here because we literally tell them, you cannot live here. You can only live out there. We absolutely have to build with that as a priority. The unregulated market does not have a social justice lens. So we have to have that in everything we do. We have to build with a social justice lens. We have to think about the people, the real people, and I count myself among them, who suffer and whose lives are on hold until we figure this out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sambal. Hey, everyone. Sambal Siddiqui. Uh, I will share a little bit about myself. Uh, I talked about throwing up too much firsthand, so sorry about that. So I am an attorney by day. I work in legal aid. I'm not one of the boring attorneys, so um, I pride myself on that. So I, I want to kind of bring it back to thinking about a uh, multifaceted uh, approach to affordability. Yes, there's inclusionary zoning. Uh, we talk about that uh, in every conversation. I think what gets left behind are the other innovative solutions to our housing crisis. Uh, and that was spoken about a little bit, but it's affordability, it's w working on affordability regionally. Uh, can we work with other cities and go to the legislator to pass a uh, law that you know offers a, a tax credit to smaller, property owners that will keep the rent below market. Uh, I think there is a huge need for below market uh, rent in our city. Uh, as someone who firsthand experience, has experience in public housing, who knows a lot of people who end up staying in public housing because unfortunately, they, if they wanna move, they're moving out of Cambridge. Uh, or you know they're saying no to promotions. These are real life experiences so that people can stay here. Uh, we have to think about ways to add more money to the affordable housing trust. You know, that can come in the form of taxes. And I think our city is exploring that. Fundamentally, we need a comprehensive housing plan. How many housing units and for whom are we building? You know, by 2030, by 2040. We don't have that yet. And I think that's what scares me about relying too much just on luxury. We do need inclusionary zoning. And with that will come market rate. I recognize that and I understand that. But what are the other policies that we can adapt in conjunction? Thank you, uh, Sambal Siddiqui. Please uh, check out my website, votesambal.com. Alana? Well, I appreciate like, you letting me go in the middle here this time because it was really tough getting up and going first. So um, I like, my name is Alana Mallon. I'm running for city council. I'd love to have your number one vote on November 7th. Um, I'd just like to address the question that you asked earlier about the 50 units with 10 units of affordable housing versus the 10 units of five units. Look, we need housing units of all levels. Regionally, we are 44,000 units short of demand and that demand is not stopping. So we need 50 units, not 10. And also to go back to the density affecting the communities who are vulnerable and of color, five units is actually a lot. I mentor a student at the high school right now who um, had a baby when she was a junior. She's back in school this year and she is on a waiting list for the Cambridge Housing Authority. And that list is long. How can we say to her and how can we not create a place for her if we have the opportunity to do so? by creating additional units. We cannot prioritize density at the expense of the stability of our most vulnerable. Thank you, alanamallon.org. Hi, Olivia D'Ambrosio, arts counselor, future arts counselor. Um, there are three things I wanna say. The first thing I wanna say is about the yes, no, abstain situation. Um, I think that 
Cambridge should be the standard bearer of progressive governance in this country, and I cannot tell you how many of these yes-no questions my colleagues and I are, are bombarded with. Uh, a feature of truly progressive governance is a political discourse that includes nuance. Yes, no, I abstain does not foster nuance, and as I am now a very experienced first-time candidate, I no longer participate in these questions because they're not helpful to us, they're not helpful to you, they're not helpful to our city, and they're not helpful to our country. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is that I have two very specific housing experiences. I just went from renting at the bone-crushing market rate, a 460-square-foot studio in one of our luxury developments, and I'm very fortunate to have just purchased a 344-square-foot studio in Porter Square. I am one of the people who is in the middle. I am very fortunate to be able to live here being in the middle, but it is tenuous. And if people like me continue to be squeezed out, our city will become less rich. And I don't mean in money, I mean in skilled kinds of people who contribute to our overall well-being. So if I am on your city council, I will keep an eye out for people like me who are in the middle. The last thing I want to say is that arts is a housing issue, arts is a transportation issue, arts is a school issue. The arts are a synergistic sector. They are overlooked and underutilized because we silo them off to the side. When we understand them as being part and parcel with all of the aspects of our civic fabric, we become more alive. Our city becomes more humanized, our city's quality of life becomes elevated. In order to have a synergistic arts sector, you need an arts counselor. And since I'm the only choice for an arts counselor, I guess that means your arts vote's gonna go to me. Okay, my time's up, thanks very much. Craig. Thank you very much. My name is Craig Kelly. I ask for your number one vote in November. Those of you who are paying attention may have noticed that I remained seated during the bike lane question. Uh, those of you who know me know that there is no person and no family in Cambridge more dedicated to bicycling and more concerned about bike safety in Cambridge than I am. You only have to see your wife in the emergency room once after a bike accident to know that it's important or have the high school call you to say that your child got hit by a car on the way to school to know that this stuff is important. It is far too important to be a yes or no question. Some bike lanes the city does, I kind of like. I like the one in front of the law school. The bike lanes they put next to cars so that the door opens in your way as you bicycle, I think are absurdly and irresponsibly dangerous. So no, I would not sacrifice any parking spaces for those lanes because they are a bad idea. And that illustrates the challenge that we face in governance. Cambridge, the region, the nation, the world are facing existential threats like we have never faced before, whether it's global population shifts, whether it's demographic changes, whether it's climate change, you can pick one, and it is major. These are not questions and challenges that will be solved by picking sides and asking yes or no questions. These are challenges that will be met by having a diverse and talented bunch of people, politicians and non-politicians, working together, willing to express themselves honestly, willing to disagree fairly, and willing to work together towards a common future. Because that future is all of ours, no matter where you live. And we will go there together, or we will not get there at all. So please, Craig Kelly, number one. Thank you. Quinton. Thank you. When I'm out talking to voters, the number one concern is the cost of housing. Some people think that the solution to this problem is to build lots of luxury priced housing. But the Lincoln Land Institute and many others have shown that in fact, doing that drives people out of the city because it raises the cost of housing for everybody. I had brought some charts which I was asked not to show, but they're here and you can come see them after the uh, debate. They're also published in cambridgeday.com if you wanna look them up, you can find them easily by my name, which is very unique, Quentin Zondervan. Um, so what we need to do is we need to have growth without displacement, not displacement by unlimited growth. 
Let's take a specific example, which is the Volpe development by MIT that's going through right now. The MIT grad students have filed a zoning petition asking for 1,800 units of grad student housing to be built by MIT on campus. I'm a co-signer to that petition. This organization, ABC, has come out in broad support of the MIT petition, but they have not come out in broad support of the graduate student petition. If, if that's how you negotiate, you're basically losing your leverage from, from the beginning. If the MIT petition goes through as is, then the grad student petition has no chance. So what we need to do is have smart negotiation. MIT is a trusted community partner. If we go to them and talk to them and say, look, you really need to do this. You need to provide grad student housing to take some of those units off the market so that other people can, can live there, then we can start to make progress. But if we just capitulate every time a developer shows up and says, we're going to build some housing, and then everybody goes, yay, let's do that, without any negotiations, then we are uh, giving up our leverage. Thank you again. Quentin Zondervan. Thank you. Adrian. Hi, my name is Adrian Musgrave, and I'm asking for your number one vote in November. Um, I am looking to fill one of those vacant seats, so I want to tell you a little bit about me. Earlier this year, I was working as a management consultant, but I feel like um, we are at an inflection point here in Cambridge where there's a chance that all that we love about our city um, is really at risk. Um, we have a really unique community that focuses on inclusion and diversity and um, some crazy modern hippies who still live here, and we all really like that. Um, in looking at, I want to let you know that I believe that we should build just a little denser and a little higher, and I think we should reform our zoning codes to allow for people in Cambridge to live everywhere. Um, what that's called is an affordable housing overlay, and I think we need to start talking about it a lot more. The real reason, and one of the main reasons I think we should be talking about affordable housing overlay is because the history of zoning is not something that is in line with our values of as a community. The history of zoning is highly exclusive. It is not inclusive. Um, it's exclusive to race and class. And I think for us to continue to move forward in our progressive city, we need to update our zoning code. We also, Sumble talked about uh, families who are are, who are not taking raises because they don't want to lose their affordable housing. We need to talk more about cliff effects and what it really means to be a low-income family here in Cambridge. Are we providing child care? We know that 18% of our children in Cambridge are living in poverty. We know that nearly 40% of our single mothers are living in poverty. Middle-class families have a hard time spending $18,000 per year, which is the average cost of childcare in Massachusetts. So figuring out what is needed to support families once they are in housing is also a critical piece of the puzzle. Thank you. So I'm asking for your number one vote and for you to go to www.voteadrian.com to learn more thank, and get in touch. Thank, thank, thank you, you. Adrian. Sean. Thanks, Sean. Uh, hi, Sean Tierney here. Um, you know, I'm running really just because I love the city of Cambridge. Um, it created the person I am today. And for my family, it created a lot of opportunities. It allowed us to get into the middle class. Uh, my mom, when she had my brothers, left a career in nursing to run a daycare out of our house. She did that for 25 years. My dad was a salesman. Next door, our neighbors uh, moved out of Lincoln Way and were able to buy a place next door to us in West Cambridge. I mean, Cambridge has historically been a city of opportunity. And I've seen it all my life. And I'm still today a volunteer with the football team helping out because I care about these kids and I care about this city. And with my skills working in housing, I want to come back to the city and help shape the future, bring some new ideas, bring some perspective about how we can leverage state resources and really increase the supply of housing in Cambridge to meet demand and be a leader on affordable housing. I want to hit a couple of the issues quickly on the bike issue. You know, what this really is to me is a change in Cambridge. There's folks who've been here for a long time and see the city changing very quickly and probably too fast for them. There's a lot of folks who are living here now who don't need a car and want to see bike lanes and just more sustainable ways of traveling. We've got to work together and what it, I see it really being is a, a proxy for this tension between the old Cambridge and the new Cambridge. But the future is bikes. 
We've got to work together, but it has to be an inclusive process. And I think that's what I want to bring to the city council is bridging that gap between the old Cambridge and the new Cambridge and trying to find ways to work together. And then quickly, just also on the um, question about market rate development in the Lincoln Land Institute, I'd just like to highlight that you know, in that report, it says that increasing market rate housing without affordability does displace folks. But if you read on to chapter four and five, they say that is why you need an inclusionary development policy. This city is a leader at 20% for our inclusionary housing policy. And you know, if we, zero per, 20% of zero is still zero. And we have to work to get to that equilibrium level that we need to get for our affordable housing. So we have to support our 20% and make thank, it work for thank us. You, thank, thank you. Thank you. Jan. Um, hi, everyone. Jan Devereaux. Uh, I am not a housing expert either, and I'm not even married to one. I'm married to a substance abuse counselor and a former singer-songwriter, so I'm liking Olivia's arts platform a lot. Um, I think she won the debate tonight, hands down. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to I direct you to the material that you were given, because it really does sort of sum up what I bring to this, which is um, a really thoughtful approach, um, someone who's well prepared and who studies the issues. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about housing for the past almost two years as a member of the Housing Committee, and I think I've been a very strong ally for many aspects of ABC's platform. Um, I've worked effectively with the colleagues that are here tonight, Dennis Carlone, who is a housing expert, being an architect and urban planner, Craig, who did amazing work on the short-term rental, and Mark, who is always the first person to say we need more affordability. So I look forward to being part of that team again. And um, I think it would surprise some of the ABC board members, maybe, um, to know that I agree with many aspects of the platform. Um, certainly the environmental, transportation, mixed use, and extra municipal policies are ones I think are very smart. Um, where I differ is that I don't think that building more densely is the only answer to the problem. I think, as others have said, it's a much more nuanced problem, and I think um, we don't need to be blaming each other. I think we need to be collaborating with ourselves, um, with our staff, who are housing policy experts. We actually have a professional staff that does that, and with regional partners. Um, so I think you know one thing that hasn't been mentioned tonight uh, are protections for tenants. Two-thirds of the people who live here are tenants. We've talked about grad student housing. I certainly think we need to build more of that. I also think we look, need to look really hard at how to maintain housing stability, how to preserve existing affordable housing, all of those things. It's a multifaceted approach. I have two websites. Uh, jandevereaux.com, where I post summaries of council agendas, and jandevereaux.org, where I'm a politician reluctantly. Thank you. Thank you. Nadia. Hi, everyone. I'm Nadia Okamoto, and I'm running for Cambridge City Council, as we all are. Um, so I'm very excited to be here today with A Better Cambridge because to me, A Better Cambridge is about home and making more opportunities to find home. Okay, I'm going to try not to get too emotional. But So I was born in New York City but I grew up with a lot of domestic violence um, and housing instability. And Cambridge was always a safe place my family would return to. Um, regularly growing up, at least multiple times a year, my godmother has lived for decades on Appleton Street. And this really was a home for us, even when we didn't have one, or didn't feel like we had a safe home to go back to. And this concept of home is something of why I'm running. I'm running because I want to protect this concept of home for all residents, regardless of their race, their religion, their socioeconomic status, their age, how long they've been here, where they came from. I have deep admi admiration for everyone sitting up here because running for office is probably the most terrifying thing I've ever done. It's one of the most exhausting things. Uh, my campaign team and I have knocked on over 13,000 doors um, since I launched. Um, and we have the blisters to prove it. But what keeps me going is the conversations that I have and this hope that we can get past just not only building affordable units, but making this an affordable and livable city for all people, regardless of their socioeconomic status. I'm running because I really think that I can add this unique perspective of someone who has experienced, has experienced housing instability, someone who has a fundamental with the re relationship with the universities to push forward more community-minded university relations, especially around real estate development. And as a young entrepreneur, uh, my background is in nonprofit management. I run period.org, uh, which is the largest youth-run NGO in women's health. Um, we have about 110 campus chapters at universities and high schools, and I've worked in policy from the local to the federal level on access um, to healthcare uh, for reproductive rights. 
My background as someone who cares deeply about this city as home and cares about preserving the city as home for all residents um, is what makes me a strong candidate for city council. And I hope you give me your number one vote on Thank November 7th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so two minutes. I'm going to try to cover several points. My name is Samuel Gebru, again, candidate for city council. So I believe that housing is a universal human right, period. That's it. And we need to house everyone. And my motto, my campaign motto is building an inclusive Cambridge. Adrian, you're totally right. Our housing policies are the history of zoning, not only in Cambridge, but everywhere else is exclusive. It's not inclusive. And you look at, you look at how Cambridge was in the 1920s and 30s, when a lot of our zoning policies were written, uh, meant to exclude a lot of people. On the issue when it comes to communities of color, uh, the reason why I'm an advocate of mixed use, mixed income housing is because that's where I live and that's where I grew up. I when we first came to this country, um, as a three-year-old, we lived on uh, Western Ave, and then now on Memorial Drive. My property, 808-812 Memorial Drive, it's three different uh, properties in one, mixed use, mixed income. We have ground level retail, um, you know, we have a gas station, Dunkin' Donuts across the street, there's a big park. Uh, within five, 10 minutes of walking, there's a Trader Joe's, there's a micro center, there is a Whole Foods, and a lot of other amenities, uh, and we're right by the river. So you can't live in a better place, and we have several bus routes in the area so I'm, I'm very happy to live where I live and it's a it's a 19 floor building and it works this is where I grew up it builds community and many of my neighbors are my friends and so I believe that when we're talking about communities of color when we're talking about the poverty that exists in this city the economic inequality that exists in this city we're going to be needing to build more housing uh, better housing, transit-oriented housing, making sure that we're not leaving people behind because that's exactly what we've done. When I was in high school, more and more of my classmates were faking their addresses to continue enrolling in Ringin Latin, but meanwhile, if you really ask them where they lived, they were in Everett or Quincy or elsewhere. And the last thing I'll say, when it comes to the regional issues, it's the Red Line Corridor and it's the Green Line Corridor. No city's gonna do this alone. We sink or swim together, and we have to work with everyone, and we need to force everyone to meet their requirements as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mark. Thank you. Um, my name is Mark McGovern. Uh, I'm going to talk about housing, uh, but if you want to hear more about the other issues I work on, such as poverty, homelessness, opioid addiction, hunger, go to markmcgovern.com or talk to me after. Uh, I really want to thank Sean for mentioning the, the Lincoln study because, you know, there's all kinds of information that's out there, um, and you really have to look at everything and do your research. The Lincoln study actually supports what we do. Um, I look at the Boston Regional Housing Report card that says cities need to get to a 5.5% vacancy rate to start to see housing prices and rental prices come down. Cambridge is at a 3.6 vacancy rate right now. I got some information from CDD in the community development. In the 10 years following the loss of rent control from 96 to 2006, we lost 4,000 units of housing, rental housing to condo conversion. One bedroom rents went up 75% during that time. From 2010 to 2013, we added 800 units of housing. Rents for a one bedroom went up 45%. Still a lot, but not at the 75. From 2013 to 2015, we added approximately 1,300 units of housing, and rents for a one bedroom dropped 8%. Building housing works, okay? And so we have to build all kinds of housing because this idea that if we don't build market rent housing, somehow people who are earning more salaries will stop coming to Cambridge is crazy. People are moving to Cambridge because the jobs are here, because it's a great city, because the schools are good, the infrastructure is good, and they're gonna keep coming. And who's gonna win in the bidding war? The person making $200,000 working at Google or the, the low-income family with the single mother for that, for that available housing stock? The people with the more vulnerable people are gonna lose. So we need to build more housing. I just want to correct one quick thing because it's on TV and I don't want people to think this. Cambridge does not allow developers to pay money and build their affordable housing off-site. They have to build their housing in the housing development that they're building. They have to be equally distributed between each floor and they have to be exactly the same as the market thank, rent. Thank, we are a you. leader in that industry. Thank you, Mark. Jeff. Thank you, Jeff Santos, Santos for CityCouncil.com. Thank you to ABC. Thank you to CCTV. To all those who are watching tonight, whether you're here in the audience or you are watching on CCTV or maybe on, online, I want to say that the people who are running tonight 
all are fantastic. They all have great backgrounds. Some have done a great job on the city council. Some are first-time challengers. I'm a first-time challenger. I'm a candidate for neighborhoods first. What does that mean? Your neighborhood, wherever you live, has to be looked at. Every person in that neighborhood has to have a fighter in city government, and in my case, also on the air as a talk show host. I built AM 1510 with investor dollars to get a voice that represented Cambridge and cities like this. I'm still on the air. I had to fight to do it every day. If I'm elected, I will fight for you on affordable housing, on public transportation, and to keeping small businesses in these communities where the rent is too damn high for them to stay here. The rent to own is a way to keep people who are paying rent being a good citizen and to pay at the rate that they're paying rent on, not the market rate. If you don't have an effective city government, an effective city government working with the state government, and the state government working with the federal government, you're never going to have a democracy that works for everybody. I have worked with people from Jesse Jackson to Mike Dukakis to Bernie Sanders and across, and I'll continue to work for you, and I'll continue to fight every day. SantosForCityCouncil.com, I thank you for coming. Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm still Dennis Carlone, and um, I hope you're listening. Um, <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm an architect, urban designer. I've worked on 2,000 units of mixed income housing. That was market rate, middle, and low together. The way that happened is there was federal money, there was state money, and there was city money. None of those programs exist anymore, so that's an issue. We are the wealthiest city in the Commonwealth by far. We have $200 million in a rainy day fund. It's raining outside. <laughs> um, very few issues in city government are black and white. They're more like my jacket. It's a weave. You weave in the best. You maximize the opportunities. That's what an urban designer does. So when we say building housing, building transit, it really is building community, building neighborhoods, building squares. That's what I've done for a living. I was a consultant, consultant to the city for 30 years. I did the East Cambridge Riverfront plan. Nobody wanted housing. I kept insisting we had housing in it to keep it vibrant. That's why there's 600 units there. And the recent Central Square zoning, uh, we were changing the zoning. I insisted and, and brought up the fact that if we're going to have developers benefit from the zoning increases, 50% of the new development had to be housing. We have great goals as a city, and you'll see the newer list coming up. We have to live up to them. We have to do everything we can to meet those needs. And that's what I love to do. I've worked with 14 different neighborhoods in the last four years to get what they want. They're the experts on what's needed. Thank you. And last but not least, um, I'm happy to say that Denise Simmons has joined us now that the school committee meeting, I presume, is over. And uh, I'd like to call on her for her two minutes. Thank you. And, and good evening. Good evening. Good evening. No, great evening. Good evening. They say the last will be first, number one, that is. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and to Jesse and the members of ABC. Thank you for putting this forum together and thank you for all of you, to all of you for coming. I meet Denise Simmons. Home, Cambridge is my hometown. I have served on the city council for eight terms, two terms as your mayor. It's been a privilege. I come to you asking you for your number one vote as someone who works hard and gets things done who works collaboratively and collegially to get those things done and will work, wants to continue to work very hard for you. I really have enjoyed this job and I'm sorry I missed hearing all of what you've had to say. I'm sure it was very nice. 
But very specifically, I, I want to speak to just a few things that I was able to do over this last term. And I, I say I, but it really is about we, because no one person can get anything done in the council. It's really the collaborative effort of many. But I'm proud to have led our um, co-chair co co-chair and led the work that we got done on linkage. As you know, through linkage, we are going to be bringing millions of dollars into the city that will go for affordable housing. But that's not all. I also co-chaired and led, co-chaired with the vice, the vice mayor and led the movement on inclusionary zoning. We increased that, and that was huge. We had not done that in nearly a decade. And that's gonna go a long way to making sure that we have more affordable housing. But most importantly, I just brought in an idea for a comprehensive housing plan that has not been done at all, ever. Again, co-chair with the vice mayor. And I look forward to be, being returned to the city council to do that kind of work. I need to do that work, want to do the work for the people that I know, for the Cambridge that I love. But most importantly, and want to add, it's not about housing in particular, but one other thing that I've worked very hard on is diversity and inclusion. We are a diverse um, community. Excuse but me. Diversity Time's is up. being invited to the table, but inclusion means that you get to eat. Time's up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so believe it or not, we're ahead of schedule. Um, and it's because of the great respect that all of you have shown for the clock and the great respect the audience has shown. Um, and so I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to, at the suggestion of, of ABC, but also exercising my own, I'm going to ask one more question to everybody. Um, and it's actually related to a question that Jan Devereaux asked because it's something that I think we all are thinking about. So here's the question, and I think we're going to give you one minute to answer this one. So we, we will try to get out of here by 8.30. Um, Two-thirds of Cambridge residents are tenants, and their average monthly rent is about $3,000. And that requires, if you, if you believe the metric that not everyone accepts, that no more than 30% of your income should be spent on rent, that means to pay that average monthly rent, you need an income, a household income of $120,000. Now, the data shows that the Massachusetts median household income is less than $70,000. So lots of residents who might want to live in Cambridge are not able to do so. The question is, is that a problem? Not everybody might agree that it is. And if it is a problem, what, if anything, can and should the city do about the problem? So there's a question for you, and I'm going to give everybody a minute to answer it. Where should I start, Jesse? <laughs> um, let's start, pardon me, I'm going to start with, uh, with Denise, just because I cut you off a minute ago, and I feel bad about that. Thank you. Uh, that was a great question, and, and when I think about what are some of the things that we, what can the city do, let me speak some, about something that I have been working on. Uh, last year, the governor signed into law the pay, a Comparable Pay Act. And why is that important? Because as p if people earn a decent wage, a comparable wage, a living wage, they can afford to live in our city or have a better ability to, to live in our city. And that's just one of the things that I was able to work on and still work on because that bill does not go into law until next year. And what I said, well, why would we wait to next year to start talking about pay equity? You know, I know my daughters, myself, my mother, your family members, particularly that they're women, don't go to a job and say, hey, I'm, paying, I'm applying for this job, and by the way, pay me less. And so it's extraordinarily important that we look at wages as a way to make Cambridge more affordable by giving people uh, the ability to make more money. In addition to that, we did have a committee that worked on the minimum wage, and you see that the state is now working very aggressively on that. And so it's those kinds of things that are going to make a difference. Thank you. And Dan, I'm going to go to you next. Oh, yeah. No. It's, a, it's an honor. <laughs> okay, here we are. Well, let's be honest. Many of the people who work here cannot afford to live here. Many of the people who work here, who used to work here, have left. Cambridge has become, whatever our objectives, if we take off our rose-colored glasses, a city 
of wealthier and wealthier people because of, frank, of the universities, Harvard and MIT, and have brought in the, uh, the research in the tech industries. And they are well paid, and they will uh, raise the housing costs. So how do we do this? How, how do we make it affordable? If we are determined to keep the working people here, there's only one route to that, which is to see that some fraction of our housing is kept at a rate that the people who work here can live here. Uh, we need to raise people's salaries. Like I support up the state house on $15 an hour minimum wage. They're fighting up there even today. So I support uh, the prevailing wage, the union rate, and I support everybody going into the unions and, and sticking up for the prevailing wage. Um, the, the, um, $15 an hour, the living wage, and we need to make earning more money. That's the bottom line. People need to be earning more money. And I don't know if they can afford $2,000 a month rent at $15 an hour, an hour. So they have a serious problem. Society has a very serious problem in trying to solve that issue. But I know that <clears throat> we need to provide affordable housing because it's in the Bill of Rights, the second Bill of Rights. So uh, I have to go back to that because so many professors and so many um, people in the community know about this. So um, we have a big serious problem and it has to be solved by everybody, by all the government officials at the State House. So we want that $15 an hour raise. Thank you. Thank Greg you. Greg Morey for City Council. Thank you. Brian. Hello. Brian Sutton, briansutton.org. I'm running for City Council, obviously. So, yeah, absolutely, this is a problem. A hundred percent. If uh, I have a dog, so if you think it's hard finding a place to live here, try to find a place to live here with a dog. That <laughs> exasperates it a little bit. Uh, so it, it's... It's obviously the demand to live in Cambridge is not going down, if anything, is going up. And the only way to really drive the prices down outside of affordable housing directives is to increase the supply. Uh, every effort should be made. New developments that are larger than a certain size should definitely have uh, housing involved in that. Upzoning should be looked at very carefully and approved whenever possible so that we can just add more quantity to what's going on. Again, supply is not going to go down, and it, it is going to be a problem, and it's a problem that's going to actually get worse over time if we don't purposely address it with everything that we do. But Brian Sutton, thank you. Thank you. Vasity. Hi, I'm Vasity Sivansai. So a little bit about myself. I'm a former refugee immigrant. I had a lot of opportunities because my family and I worked really hard. I became a community advocate and a public policy director. And what I see are the three things that our city can do to help uh, folks stay in our city and to come to our city is that we need to build um, a stronger workforce pipeline into the industries in our city, right? Biotech, higher ed. We also need to um, expand affordable housing. Affordable housing meaning lower to middle income. And then we gotta look at our education. Where do we build the best opportunity? early education, right? Add an additional 2,500 per month to um, 3,000 per month. That's a serious issue. Thank you. Paul. Sure, uh, Paul Toner. Um, a number of the things have already been said, but I think first of all, we have to do our best to increase the housing stock and we have to provide a variety of options uh, to keep a cross section of uh, income uh, eligibility here in, in Cambridge. Uh, we are not gonna be able to house everybody that wants to live in Cambridge. We can do our best to make sure that we have diversity, uh, socioeconomic diversity in Cambridge, and we do need to do our part. We do need to have a more regional approach uh, and work with the surrounding cities and towns, uh, and we have to work uh, with our schools and our, our uh, employers here in town uh, to make sure that we create access to the jobs that are available, and I, to, uh, we talk a lot about things called uh, pathways to prosperity. Uh, every child in Cambridge should have access and opportunities to work in the companies and uh, the new 
uh, economy that we have here in, uh, in Kendall Square and in Cambridge. Uh, in addition, I support uh, increasing the minimum wage as well in order to provide uh, greater salaries. Thank you. Gwen. Thanks very much, Gwen Volmer, running for City Council. Um, I am part of that group that falls below this 65, 70,000 number that was quoted. So obviously my answer to this question is going to, the question of what can we do to help those people, my answer is going to be put them on city council. Um, I, I genuinely believe that when there is someone in the room who has a personal stake in the decisions that are getting made, they will be made with that person in mind more directly than if there is no one in the room who has ever struggled to pay their bills. That's what we have to be looking for. I will say it again, there are strong incentives for developers to come and get creative in terms of the kinds of variances that they will ask for. We have to have people with incentives just as strong. And the best developer to encourage to build in Cambridge is the city. Wouldn't that be fantastic? We can get all of our desires met. We can get 100% affordable housing built if we just encourage the city to do it. Thank you, Sumbul. Uh, so I speak from the perspective of a boring attorney who is, you know, has had a hard time living here. Um, as Gwen said really eloquently, you know, as renters, and I think many of us in the room are renters, um, it, it's a huge problem. Uh, we will not be able to buy a house here. A single family home is a $1.8 million. Um, I pray about the lottery, but <laughs> it's not happening. Uh, and so we have to think about uh, how do we how do we increase um, how do we increase supply, uh, but do it in a way that is sustainable? Uh, I think that there's uh, the workforce housing uh, program that many of the cities I work in, Lynn, Lawrence, uh, Lowell, are utilizing. They're offering housing in developments for folks who can't afford subsidized housing, uh, but the uh, the market rate is too expensive. So that's one way uh, we can get at this problem, but. Uh, it is, will be a regional um, effort, as you've heard, uh, but uh, I think uh, this, this group of people, uh, many of them will be fighting for it. Thank you. Alana. Hi, my name is Alana Mellon. Um, you know, we, this is absolutely a problem. We are a barbell city right now, which means that we have a lot of people who are on the high income side and on the low income side. And we need to be thinking about this. There's no specific policies. that We could all talk about all these policies tonight that we could implement, but it's gonna take a coordinated community effort to combat this crisis. And the wheels exist, the ideas exist, they're out there, and we don't need to reinvent them. Our CDD department is stuffed, you know, they're staffed with housing experts, and the city council should be empowering the CDD and make sure that they have adequate staff and funding to turn their expertise into action. We also need to look outside of our own cities and see which creative solutions are being adopted elsewhere and see if we can adapt them for our own community. But again, we all know up here that there's no one magic silver bullet. We just need to work together. We need a city council that is gonna work with our CDD department and, and really work on this urgent, urgent issue. Thank you. Dennis, I'm gonna to go to you. Hi, I am Dennis. and. Uh, when you build um, housing of any kind, there are, there are a number of factors that are key. Obviously, land ownership. City owns land. Uh, but number two is the interest rate. And that can be subsidized by governmental uh, efforts. Um, and that's something that we can do. However, I don't think we'll ever get down to 3.6 um, uh, to get lower the rents. I hate to say it, it's not going to happen. It didn't happen with the last recession. So this has to be an all-out effort by the city and for all of us to tell the state and the feds this is a priority. We need funding like we used to have. Thank you. Dennis Carlo. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you. Thank you all again. Jeff Santos, Santos for CityCouncil.com. Just want to point out one thing that we all have to work together. I have had the experience of working with labor, been endorsed by over a dozen labor unions. Also, I work closely with the Sierra Club. James McCaffrey, the former executive director, has endorsed me. I work closely with both the Sierra Club, Carl Pope, and uh, Leo Gerard, the steel workers. You bring labor, blue-green alliance together, 
That is how we accomplish things. We also put pressure. We put pressure on our great senators, Warren and Markey, to do what they can federally. We put pressure on, on people who are in state government. There are people in this room who can make a difference. I want to start a citizen's advisory council if I get elected. All of these things together can make a difference. And by the way, I own a bike, and for all of those bike enthusiasts, when I st stood by myself, I'm with you as well. Let's build more bike paths. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So there is no silver bullet answer to this. Uh, to this, so I'm going to go through a list of things and part of my housing plan. Maybe not as great as Sean's, but you know, he's got uh, more experience with me than this. An office of housing stability, gap vouchers, which will for people on Section Eight or on housing vouchers, a gap voucher is where. The Section 8 ends and market rent begins. There is a gap there. We need to look at how do we help people fill that gap. $15 minimum wage. Strengthen our condo conversion protections. Build more housing of all types. Be more aggressive acquiring property so we can partner with affordable housing developers, as we did and are doing with Vail Court and property up on Concord Ave. Uh, I was involved in both of those um, issues. Uh, build more below market rent housing on city-owned parking lots in Central Square, another policy order that I had filed last, uh, last term with then Vice Mayor Benzan. Uh, and having a regional conversation uh, about housing, which has to involve not just Boston and Somerville, but our suburban communities who are not pulling their weight. Thank about, you. About 40 percent of our Section 8 uh, voucher holders out of the Cambridge Housing Authority don't live in Cambridge because they can't find a place. So. One thing we need to do right away is build more housing. I agree with Mark, we need to build more housing on city-owned parking lots. Uh, there are several in Central Square, let's take over those. If we're serious about prioritizing people over cars, then we have to put our money where our mouth is. I love what we did in Vail Court. I love what we did with 20% inclusionary housing. Uh, the Affordable Housing Trust uh, released a report early last year. Let's implement it. It's a great report. Uh, one of their recommendations, looking at increasing the uh, percentage for area median income, uh, making sure that we're building building more moderate income and middle income housing, making sure that we're giving people an incentive to not not take the promotion to uh, to find a better job that pays more, and then also when it comes to our public schools, uh, to make sure that we're pro providing pathways for our children to go from the public schools to Kendall Square jobs. We need to make sure that we're providing them with 21st century skills that pays them very good incomes to be able to compete and live in Cambridge. I mean, I think we can all agree up here that it is a problem that we have residents here who are struggling to afford to actually live in Cambridge. Um, so I'm not going to echo too much of what's already been said, but I do think that there are ways that we can bring new ideas um, and alternative housing options to Cambridge as well. Um, that comes from anywhere pushing forward more um, inclusionary zoning, not only with low-income housing, but also 5% for middle-income housing, which was shown to be done, uh, possible in the feasibility study. Um, there, I see no reason not to do that. Um, also, I think that something that hasn't been mentioned that we should be explored as well is the opportunity to build housing co-ops um, and new ways of um, providing ways for people to be able to afford to live here as well. Um, I think also really, really trying to push universities to be more community-minded about real estate development. Um, and that stands for anywhere from the commercial real estate that they're bringing in um, all the way to, yes, building more graduate student housing. Um, when you look at the people who are looking at, for housing right now, I think that it's really important to, as city councilors, not only vouch for them in city council, but also beyond that as well, because this isn't a Cambridge-only problem. Thank you. Jan. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, glad to have inspired this very thoughtful question, <laughs> this sort of lightning round. Um, I want to say that we talk a lot about the number of units that we need, and we don't always make the connection to the number of people who are going to be living in those units. Um, and you know, it, it's we need to think about the other things that we need to do to support the new people living in those units, whether it's schools or parks or better transportation or all kinds of infrastructure. Um, in your platform, it mentions that the population of Cambridge was 120,000 in 1950. It was a very different city there. Probably where we're sitting now was a rubber factory or a hose factory or a candy factory or something. It was a working class population with a lot of children, many fewer cars. Um, much larger households. I, I want to say that I could not afford to live here today on a city council salary. Um, were I looking to buy a house today, I'm lucky. I recognize that. I want to help other people be lucky. And for that, we need to incorporate all of the ideas mentioned tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Sean? 
Uh, Yes, so I mentioned earlier I have a housing plan on my website that I encourage you to check out, seantierney.org, but a lot of what that is is tinkering around the edges. We can do real estate transfer taxes. We can increase the hotel motel tax and put that into the Affordable Housing Trust. We can find different ways to uh, petition the state legislature for home rule petitions for increasing the rental deduction. But what this question really highlights is the dire situation we're in and the need for regionalization. The past three years, I've been working on legislation that would mandate multifamily zoning in the suburbs. And what this highlights is that, you know, in the 1980s, we were building 40,000, 50,000 units per year statewide. Last year, 15,000. The year before that, 14,000. We're not building like we used to in the state of Massachusetts. And what we have to do, you know, I have to compliment Vice Mayor McGovern who had the intergovernmental, intermunicipal um, group on homelessness that got together. We need something similar on housing, because two thirds of all the development that's happening is in Cambridge, Boston, Chelsea, Everett, Somerville. We need to come together and put pressure Thank on the suburbs to, to get this done. Thank you, Adrian. Hi, my name is Adrienne Musgrave, and I'm asking for your number one vote in November. The original question was about, um, are we full? And I don't believe that we are full here in Cambridge. I also believe that we are such a unique place with unparalleled resources in this community. And we know that the opportunity of growing up in a prosperous zip code, especially for children, um, makes a huge difference in their lives. And so I think that we should be prioritizing housing so that we can have more children who live here. I also think that when we talk about people who already live here, we need to make sure that they have access to the booming economy that we're in right now. And over and over, I feel like so many of our residents are actually missing out on this, and they would have an opportunity to increase their wages. Um, Mark talked about what's called the cliff effect with that gap funding. Um, we need to think about both the cost that families endure, but also um, how much money they're able to bring in to bring more people here to Cambridge. Thank you so much. Thank you. Quinton. It is shameful how we treat people in this country. Is this a supply problem? We have more vacant homes in America than homeless people, okay? We need to invest in our communities, not sell our communities out to investors. The cost of housing is driven by the cost of land, which is driven by speculation. We need a foreign buyer's tax to drive down speculation. We need a land trust like Bernie Sanders did in Burlington, Vermont, when he was the mayor that is delivering on affordable home ownership today. This is a justice issue, and we need to look at it as a justice issue. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Thank you very much. Cambridge needs to be taller, it needs to be denser, it needs to have more housing, it needs to have fewer cars. We're trending that way somewhat, not fast enough. There is another cliff effect out there. Uh, this summer I biked throughout Massachusetts. You go beyond 495 and there's a cliff, and there's a cliff of opportunity, there is a cliff of housing, there is a cliff of wealth, and there's a cliff of jobs. We need to regionalize far beyond Kendall Square or we will be the superheated market that we are now. People ask me about the Amazon headquarters, and I say that is not what we want in this region. We might want it in Albany. We, we want to spread that wealth, and we want that wealth in terms to spread the opportunity. It can't all be in Cambridge. Not just the jobs, not just the housing. We need to learn to share, and that is part of my thoughts on regionalization. Thank you. Hi, Olivia, future arts counselor. Um, I mentioned that I just went from renting a studio to purchasing one, 344 square feet. In order to purchase that unit, I had to bid at 20% over the asking price to win out over a sight unseen investor. I think it would be healthier for us to cultivate owner occupants and instead of sight unseen investors and for this reason I think we need to work as a council and potentially with condo boards or other bodies that have any sort of power over these uh, sales to incentivize sales to owner occupants and not to sight unseen investors or any other kind of investors. That's the first thing. Second thing is um, I don't rake in my Doe acting and directing plays, acting in and directing plays. The reason I'm able to afford to live in Cambridge is because I'm a lecturer at MIT. I teach acting there. They're a very good employer. 
Uh, if we could work with these two incredibly powerful universities to create some other really solid jobs for people like me who live in Cambridge, it would be possible for other people like me to become homeowners. Thanks. All right, well, that's it. I want to give, uh, let's give the candidates a round of applause. Thank, thank you all. Um, and thanks, thanks to our moderator, uh, David Sullivan, uh, for working with us on this. I know we're past 8.30 now. I have just a couple uh, qu uh, quick items I want to mention. I know the item, the issue of a minimum wage came up in a few people's responses. Uh, Bill uh, McAvaney and Carolyn Fuller are actually collecting signatures uh, to um, uh, get a ballot question uh, to raise the minimum wage to $15 in Massachusetts. So they'll be out there collecting signatures for that. Um, the programs that you had that had a short snippet from most candidates who are up here tonight, uh, those full candidate questionnaire responses, as David said at the beginning, will be on the ABC website by the end of this week. That's abettercambridge.org. Um, we also, as ABC, will soon be um, endorsing candidates, um, so stay tuned for that. That will be informed by uh, the questionnaires, this debate, and, and some interviews. Um, I also want to say that ABC is a membership organization with hundreds of members around the city of Cambridge. Um, if you believe in what we stand for um, and you want to learn more about us, we do have our platform out there. We also invite you to become a member. It's a $20 suggested membership um, and we'd love to have your support and you can do that out in the hall. Um, ABC is also going to be hosting our first annual fundraiser to support our work that's coming up on October 5th. Um, I would encourage you to attend. We're going to have dinner, uh, silent auction, uh, and more. Uh, and it's going to be over at Mead Hall. Again, that's on October 5th. And you can find more about that on our website, abettercambridge.org. So I hope to see many of you there. And then finally, don't forget to vote on Tuesday, November 7th. That's seven weeks away. Is that right, candidates? Seven weeks? Yeah. <laughs> seven weeks away. So it's coming up. So don't forget to vote. And thank you very much for coming out. We appreciate it.